Hey, Congregation of Mighty, this is Prophet Marie Solberg, and I am joining you today. And we are just going to go back and discuss some really, some really key and important things that Dr. Price is discussing with us uh, about Dunamite, about being a Dunamite, how to become a Dunamite, what a being a Dunamite looks like. Um, so we just wanted to go back and review a couple of things, you know, on She's got so many amazing, you know, PowerPoint slides where she shows so much information. And sometimes you just need to stop. You just need to go back and, and review and be like, what all was there? What all was she saying? So we are going to take that time and that opportunity to go ahead and do that. So let's go ahead and get in it. So we are discussing today the Dunamite class of the Dunamite Miracle Worker How to Class. So yes, let's get in it. All righty. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of, I'm going to move this down here for a second so you guys can still see me. But all right. Um, she had mentioned and she, she uh, Dr. Price had pointed out really clearly that it starts, it all starts with words. And it's very interesting and very clear that you know she went through that. So let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and look at that and see what exactly. Let's pull that from scripture and kind of pull that together. So looking at Luke 6, 45, a good man out of the good treasure in his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure in his heart brings forth evil for out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So it's really interesting to try and pull apart and really see what that scripture is saying. So here we're seeing, so, okay, so the heart simply is expressing uh, what is being pushed out from the soul and the mouth speaks what is overflowing from the heart. So here we can see how truly it, it starts with the words. It's all about the words because that the words are that indication of what is not only in the heart, but what is the abundance, what is the overflow of the heart. So let's stop and think about that. Think about uh, that in reference to someone who is bitter, someone who is always sarcastic, someone who is always has a snotty remark about something, someone who we, so we may know some of those individuals or we may be one of some of those individuals where you always have to have the last word. You always have to be right. Uh, going through those different scenarios, you can stop and think of like, okay, so those words that we or that other person are speaking, that's the abundance, that's the overflow of their heart. So their words and the words that come out of our mouths is an, not only an indication, but it is a true evidence of the overflow of what is in our hearts. And what's in our hearts is simply being, is that expression of those roots that are in our soul. So if you can imagine, like I said, and this is why scripture too says, you know, bitterness as is as rotting to the bones, because it's a clear indication of the things that are harboring and the things that are present in the soul and in the heart and what their meditations are. So think about that. Think about that in the terms of the words that you use, uh, in the words that you repeat. Uh, in the words that you even focus on, and we'll start to get into those thoughts as well. So yes, the heart is simply expresses, the heart simply expresses what is being pushed out from the soul, and the mouth speaks what is overflowing from the heart. So here too, let's go ahead and uh, look at Proverbs 6.2. You are snared by the words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. And, you know, a lot of times 
we kind of go through those passages in scripture and be like, oh, there, there the Lord goes again. He's just repeating himself. Or we're like, oh yeah, like that's saying the same thing. No, let's look. Let's look and see what those words mean. So snared in the Hebrew there means to be ensnared, both literally and figuratively. So by the words of the, your mouth, you're, uh, you're caught in an argument or you uh, in an argument that say maybe you can't get out of. You are snared, you are entangled by the words of your mouth, say an agreement that you can't get out of. You are entangled, you are ensnared by the words of your mouth. Um, to like say a situation that you seemingly can't get out of or a situation that seems to constantly repeat itself in your life. That came from your words. So you are ensnared, you are entangled by the words of your mouth. So to even snare um, is you getting tripped up. You, you getting caught up in trouble, you, you catching trouble. You know, like they used to say, you, you catch in trouble. And that stems from the words of your mouth, which again, feeds back into the overabundance of your heart, which feeds back into what is being expressed and pushed out from your soul. This is why it's so important to consciously be aware of the words that we're taking in as well as the words that we're putting out. So, and take it. You are taken by the words of your mouth. What does that mean? So literally that means to, uh, to catch. You are caught by the words of your mouth uh, to capture or occupy. You occupy by the words of your mouth, uh, both good and bad. I mean, as I said, there's like the scripture above, I mean, you know, good treasure and evil treasure. Okay, so you are captured or you can occupy by the words of your mouth to choose. You choose things in your life by the words of your mouth. That's what scripture says. We choose what is in our lives and what is for us and against us by the words of our mouth. And that's why, especially as agents of the kingdom, we're judged by every word, every idle word that comes out of our mouth. There's really no idle word for us. Uh, be frozen, stuck to, frozen to, you are frozen to a situation or you are frozen to uh, a particular outcome or a particular outcome is frozen to you by the words of your mouth. This is why, this is why it is so, so important um, and how everything stems from words and how that, that actually is specifically from God and how that all leads into how we are to be drafted and reconfigured as Dunamites. All right, so we're going to show just this uh, really uh, quick clip here of the power of words. And this is just a, a straight little scientific project that these kids did. Sorry, we'll go ahead and start from the beginning. Blossom makes me happy. You're making a difference in the world. You are beautiful. 
I brought them here to see the plan, I was like, a plant is getting bullied. Like, it's not normal. I think it's an excellent project. To have something tangible that they can actually physically be a part of is, I think, going to be very powerful. As the weeks passed, I started noticing that the one that was being bullied uh, started kind of to droop. While the plant that was being complimented, it was, it was flourishing and beautiful. It's raised the profile massively of different forms of bullying and the effects that bullying can have on people. If it affects a plant, it can definitely affect other people. So I know that was just a, a really quick, really uh, brief little experiment, but that was just to show you. So, and of course their focus was on bullying, uh, but this is really to show, so a plant is just a very uh, simple structure cell. It's not even a complex cell structure. It's a very simple uh, structure cell is what plants are derived from. And that is the effect that words had on those two particular plants. Uh, and they were very specific in their environment control. Both of them got the same water. Both of them got the same sunlight. Both of them got the very same exposures. It's just one listen to a recording. A plant was exposed to a recording of positive and affirming statements, and the other one was negative. And it literally started to wilt. It literally started to die, away, to just wilt away and die. And that was just in a matter of 30 days, just in 30 days. So what does that do? And like I said, that was, it wasn't like one was poison and one wasn't literally the, the only difference between the two, both were being fed, both were given everything that they needed. It's just one was being exposed to negative comments and the other one, positive comments. So that just goes to show even in that, in that very simple experiment, the power of words. How powerful are right words? Especially even when scripture talks about the word of a king. Okay, the word of someone in our stance. See, we want to go ahead and try and pick and choose when our words should be impactful and when they shouldn't. When the case is, if we are going to be those individuals, if we are going to be those key agents in the kingdom where our words are powerful, we don't get to pick and choose when that happens. We don't get to pick and choose when and where are we should be taken literally are we or not, or we should be taken for real or not. It's either It's either on or it's off. Either that power and that authority is there or it isn't. See, if we ever stopped and took just some knowledge, uh, you know, just took a chance of what if for a whole 24 hours, kingdom agents, you know, say, uh, you know, uh, some form of delegated angels or some form of delegated angelic hosts, part of heaven, part of eternity had to obey the words that came out of my mouth for 24 hours what would heaven look like what would what would eternity look like because eternity it, it's it's just there it's just in an existence there there's no stop time end time so for 24 hours would have heaven operated off of the words that came out of your mouth and so, well, you know, for some of you, you may be thinking, well, I mean, I don't say a lot, but we're going to get into that of how words are even 
the expression, the thoughts, the, the motivation of what you are even stewing about. See, a lot of people think that just because they're stewing about something doesn't mean that they're not imparting. And that's not true. They are, trust me. <laughs> oh, trust me. I am one of those individuals where say if a situation happens that I don't agree with, oh, I'll absolutely be professional and I'll say the right things. And I'll definitely, you know, control my facial expressions, you know, definitely as best I can, uh, you know, control, you know, how I am trying to express myself. But at the end of the day, am I fooling anyone? I'm not they know I'm upset about this, or they know I don't really agree about that. But they register my attempt of just trying to be respectful. So, and somehow we think that God doesn't know. <laughs> we can't fool ourselves. God knows. I've got Holy Spirit absolutely knows. Uh, but too, like I said, even that emphasis, that expression does get put out there as far as our feelings, our emotions, our attempts, those words do get expressed in one way, shape, or form. Oops. Press the next one. So that is the very reason why, because words have such an impact. And see, if we're going to be true dudamites, it's not something we can step out of and step in, you know, step in when we want to be taken seriously and when we're in our mantle or we're in our, you know, walking in our title, you know, <laughs> walking in that and be able to step out when we're off duty. There is no off duty when it comes to dudamites. Either those angels, uh, those principalic forces respond to, <coughs> excuse me, to your words, your commands, or they don't. I mean, out of the grace of the God, they just they're subjective. <laughs> so to be a true dunamites, we have to be able to have that measure of control of my words are always powerful. And this is too why the drills are so important. So even like I said, look, looking at even from scripture, so Ephesians 6, 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So this is why our words have to line up with God and with his will and his purpose. Second Corinthians 10, three through six. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war against according, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warf warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments. That's words. That's words. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought. This is why as Deutamites, it's our words and our thoughts. It's both. So just when you're thinking, oh, well, I'm saying the right words. Mm -mm, that's not what scripture says. Go, go back, go back and read it. It's, it. it's right there. So bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all the disobedience. Being in that seat of power and authority, being ready to punish all obedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Can we say, praise God, that his mercies are new every morning <laughs> for that scripture, okay? <laughs> yes. So what, so sometimes, you know, you can just think of drills of, oh yeah, well, I did it once or twice, you know, a week, whatnot. Why is it important? Why, why is it so meaningful? Why is it so necessary to do? The number one purpose, the number one purpose of drills to prepare troops for battle. We just looked at Ephesians 6, 12. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about right now. That's what the scripture is saying 
to prepare troops for battle. Drill procedures practiced. Drill procedures that are practiced. You got to practice saying those words. You got to practice those prayers. You have to practice those decrees. You know, I can always tell someone who's like, kind of just, you know, when they pray, they're like, how, you know, just kind of hopping back and forth when they're having to like read through each, every little thing. We don't practice those drills. They're, they're not practicing those decrees to be able to really have those decrees and, and put the emphasis of the spirit behind it that you need. You have to practice those decrees. You have to practice praying out those decrees and not when you're just in front of somebody. Amen. So yes, drills are the procedures practiced. Those protocols and those procedures practiced have been identified, have been identical to the tactical maneuvers. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Have you ever seen a wrestling match? It is a lot that is involved and it takes a lot of energy. So to prepare troops for battle, drill procedures practiced have been identical to the tactical maneuvers employed on the battlefield. This is why your dunamite drills are important. This is why those dunamite drills have to come alive for you. They have to literally be start being ingrained and being a part of you. Because we just looked through those two, those two scriptures that tell us why. So they enable a commander or non-commissioned officer. So a person in authority, a person say working towards those places of authority, or how about you just being an officer over your own life? Hey, how about that? So enable a commander or non-commissioned officer to move his unit from one place to another in an orderly manner. How about you just transitioning, say from one job to another or transitioning from one living environment to another or what have you transitioning uh, from lethargy or, or say procrastination in one area to another in an orderly fashion due to my drills. That's why that, that's important. Aid in disciplinary training. Drills help you be disciplined. Aid in disciplinary training by instilling habits. These drills transcend into habits. And how do we know that that happens? Because obviously it's the, we can see if we even just take that scripture that we read before and reverse it, that that's how it starts. Again, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So that habitation, that habit has already been not only working, but is overflowing. And that's what's being evident in your, in your words. So here we can see these drills are important to engraft and put in because they aid in disciplinary training by instilling habits of precision and response to the leader's orders. See, sometimes we can be like the children of Israel and we respond, but we respond in our way. We respond or we respond in our timing and not his, and we totally miss the window that God has given us. That can be from fear. That can be from intimidation. That can be from just a lack of faith. Okay. Uh, you know, maybe mistaking uh, wisdom for fear, where things aren't looking like they're in the right place for us to move. But... <laughs> When God, when Moses commanded the children of Israel to go into that battle, by no means did it look like they could win. When Joshua and Caleb went into the promised land that was promised to them, how many came back? 
okay. The 10 came back and was like, this, this is a bad idea. We're going to lose. It was only Joshua and Caleb that said, this is what God has promised. We can do this. And yeah, there's giants and there's all this in the land, but there's also great harvest in the land and we can totally do it because this is what God has promised. And this is what we've been training for. This is what we've been training for for 40 years. Some of you, you've been training and you've been putting in this time uh, for uh, a job position or for uh, trying to attain, a, you know, a, maybe a certain place in ministry or trying to attain a certain place in your walk. And God's like, God's like, I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you to engage. I'm waiting on you to move forward. The scripture says, if you, then I. So God is waiting for that engagement on your side. So aid in disciplinary training by in instilling habits. You know, a habit is something that you can get in place that you do that is productive, uh, that keeps you on routine, uh, keeps you on the pattern of success. Habits of precision and response to the leader's orders. And I put in their leader, you know, with a capital L, obviously meaning Jesus Christ, but also the leaders that are over you. You know, for some of you, you know, you may be a little slow to uh, actively and uh, rapidly respond to, say, input from your mentors, uh, import, input from uh, either a prophetic word or whatnot that was given you input from just uh, a friend that God used to impart a, a piece of knowledge or wisdom or understanding to you, you you will slow to move on that or say from an individual that you think is under you that you think eh, you really don't need to listen to. Hence why a prophet had to have a talking to from a donkey. You don't want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to go, I have to go to those like kind of extremes. So, and to provide for uh, the development of all soldiers in the practice of commanding troops. And this could be commanding the troops of your own mind. Okay, commanding your own mind, com having command over your own life, having command over your words, having Again, like the scripture, like 2 Corinthians said, having command over the thoughts, bringing them captive, having command first over your own soul. Amen. So, all right. This is why the drills are critically important. So here we have uh, even going into uh, dynamite. I'm so sorry. Deutamite drills, uh, the cadence or sound off. So why is this important? Uh, so a cadence, why is you know, the deutamite cadence important? So a cadence while running or marching helps soldiers keep their heads up, keep their heads up and, and take deeper breaths and inhale more and exhale more forcefully. This increases oxygen to the lungs and gives the body more energy. So a cadence is really important because it helps maintain pace. It helps keep your head up. Sometimes you have no idea, like if you've ever been running and you have your head down and you're trying to run, it's you're literally cutting off part of your oxygen supply, as well as the mental effect. The mental effect of running with your head down versus running with your head up. You know, we've been called to run this race to win. So a cadence, that dudamite drill, that dudamite cadence, and a, you know, it helps you keep your head up and take in the vitality, take in the spiritual nutrition, take in the oxygen, take in the refreshing that your soul is needing, 
that of course pours over into your heart and into your body, into your psyche, into your mental health. So yes, and it gives your body more energy. And I'm telling you what, when you start to pour in and you start to take up and you start to become these drills, it energizes you. It activates your spirit. It activates your God DNA. So two of that cadence, uh, cadence can help you decrease fatigue so you can run longer. You know, for some of you, it, you're just like, you know, e either by midday or by end day, you're done. You're, you're just done. You're like, I'm, I'm not going to do anything else. I just, oh, I had a hard day or all of a sudden it turns into every day is a hard day. Or all of a sudden, you know, every day, you know, at the end of the day, you, you need ice cream or, or something as a self-soother. Cadence. Getting in that cadence of the dudamite drills. It can decrease fatigue. And I tell you what, one of the things I looked up was uh, when I was studying this is uh, the optimum cadence for a 5K. And I was like, oh. I like to run 5Ks. I mean, I am still working up to it now. I'm about getting back to it. And I was like, you know, what is the cadence for uh, one good optimal cadence for 5K? It's 180 strides per minute. Let me tell you what, I'm not there yet. I am not there yet, but I'm getting there. But it takes, like we talked about, it takes that practice. These drills take practice. That cadence has to be worked into your soul and into your heart. All right, so becoming God's dunamites. Here we go. So, and it, it involves assuming our role, taking our place, taking the reins, and exercising our elect offspring authority. So assuming our role, you know, a lot of times, you know, people, you know, we like to say, you know, it, it's not good to make assumptions. You should be informed. But another definition of assuming is to take or begin to have power or responsibility. It is truly the mark of amazing leaders when they can assume the authority of an assignment when they assume authority of their team, when they assume authority of a task or a duty. So a lot of times, you know, we have, you know, individuals that they have no problem assuming the title of prophet, apostle, whatnot, uh, you know, assuming the title, but not the work or the responsibility. That's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. But no, and that just shows that, you know, again, down the road at some point where either through trial, temptation, whatnot, they show their true colors by their words, by their actions, typically first by their words, if you listen closely. So assuming our role is to take and begin to have power or assume responsibility. He assumed the responsibility of that task. He assumed the responsibility of getting that done. That's what it means to be a dunamite, becoming a dunamite, assuming the power and responsibility of our role, taking our place. This um, can be taking our assignment, taking our position, not just in the spirit, but also in the natural. You know, that can require training. That can require, you know, putting in the hours uh, that are needed, just the attention. Uh, for some things, you know, we kind of just, we think it would, if we just put, you know, do it here, do it there, and kind of, no, some things take that focus, time, and effort. That effort to be put in to obtain, uh, and not only have a assignment completion, but to obtain those positions, those positions of power and influence. So in taking the reins, that means to take control. There are situations in our lives that as we are becoming dunamites, we have to take control. 
you know, for some of us, you know, that may be uh, taking the control of our diet, taking the reins of our diet, uh, taking the reins of our appetite, uh, taking the reins of our taking control uh, of our physical well being. It's not all just spiritual, it's spiritual and natural. Okay. Uh, taking control or taking the reins of our temper, taking control or taking the reins of our destiny and our purpose. You know, Jesus did the cross duty. Jesus and put in us. I mean, if you can just imagine uh, the awesomeness of our maker and creator, God has literally encoded, you know, and grafted everything that is needed for our dominance, for our, uh, for our destiny, for our call, for our purpose, everything that we are, we're already made for it. Everything that we need to be, we're already made for it. But I said, through those dunamite drills, through the becoming and being engrafted into the Godhead and actually cellulating, animating the word, bringing into animation, you know, back in the day to animate something, you had to draw it out. You had to bring it into existence. You know, to anim animate something means to bring it to life, to make it move to bring motion and action to it. Those are the things that we need to take on in even our destiny and purpose. They're in there. They need to be developed. They need to be processed. They need to be brought forward. They need to be worked on. And, you know, and we're all in different processes and different places of our lives. But you know, the point is to let those dudamite drills start the process and let them be engrafted into our souls. So taking the reins, taking control, you know, not just leaving it to chance. And even in that, not just leaving it to our prayer closet, not just leaving it up to God. You know, a lot of times we're given prophetic words, we're given prophecies, and we're just like, yes, amen. And or we can even just, you know, hit play on that recording and just let it play and play and play and play. And that's good. It, you're, it's building up your faith. That's building up your thoughts. That's building up your mentality to be able to bring that into existence. But there's also the work that is involved, the action items. You know, sometimes you gotta have to stop and listen and listen to uh, your words critically. Listen to your words as an assignment. Like sit down and listen to your words like it's homework that God's given you. Because really that, I mean, for a lot of your guys' prophetic words, that's what it is. It's homework that God's giving you. And some of you, you're just wanting to take an incomplete on those prophetic words. This is not the time or the season that you want to do that. That's not the Dunamite way. Taking an incomplete, that's not the Dunamite way. You're not going to get anywhere. So, and for some of us, you know, we're just getting a, a failing grade because we're not putting in the work. We're not putting in the time. We're not putting in the effort. We got to put in the effort of what God is telling us to do and not just leave it up to the spirit. Now, yes, there's some things that have to be activated, obviously, and spoken into existence first in the spirit by, by faith by activating our faith, by pulling on the principalic powers of the Godhead. Yes, absolutely. But there's also very tangible, very physical things that God wants you to do. You know, just like with any athlete, you can take any athlete and you can even see them as a kid. You're like, man, you can, you can speak over to them their whole lives. You are going to be an amazing swimmer. Say, say it's a, an athletic swimmer. You are going to be an amazing swimmer. I mean, you have an affinity for this. You love being in the pool. You love everything having to do with the water. Like, man, like you, you are going to be an amazing swimmer. So even in that, you're like, okay, great. Awesome. That's, that's fabulous. 
But unless that kid grows up to where he makes that decision, he or she makes that decision of, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do with my life. This is what I want to pursue. This is how I want to go forward. Because what? Then they, they get into trainings. They get a coach. They start practicing. So some of you need to find out what are your dunamite practices? How do you practice being a dunamite? Just, just bring it down to ABC. What are the habits that you are going to practice? And at first, you got to practice before they ever get solidified as a habit, before it ever becomes SOP, before it ever becomes a reflex. It has to first be practiced over and over and over again. Your words are the same way. Those dunamite drills, those words, those utterances, those decrees, they have to be practiced so that they become automatic. They become like a reflex. You know, I don't know if you guys have ever, you know, had, had friends that um, have either been like advanced military or, uh, you know, some form of security or whatnot. Uh, there's just certain things you don't do in their presence uh, because they have, because of their training, because of their drills, because of everything that, I mean, physical drills that they have put themselves through, the cadence that they have constantly put themselves through, the training that they have constantly put themselves through. There are certain things you don't do to them. You know, like someone who maybe has like advanced training or uh, it's a commando or something like that. I mean, like that's not somebody you just kind of like sneak up and startle or that you, you, you surprise them or try and startle them or, you know, just for giggles. You may not want to do that or kind of out of the blue, like poke them, you know, because you think it's going to be funny. You probably really don't want to do that uh, because they have reflexes. They have habits. They have practice traits that are now just a reflex, whether that it is to block, whether that's to throw a punch and maybe they have, hopefully have enough discipline to pull it back you know, what not to where those are reflexes, but those are things that have to be practiced. So take the time, go in and look and take the time, be like, God, what are the habits? What are my due to my habits that you want me to practice? What are the things that you want me to practice for my destiny, for my purpose? for attaining this or for attaining that, that you have spoken over in my life or, or given me? What are, you know, what are the things for financial freedom that I need to practice? What are the things uh, for deliverance that I need to practice? You know, if you have something that has been instilled uh, within your, even like, like the example of the plants, of the, you know, those experiments for the plants, Say, I mean, you went obviously past 30 days, you have had a lifetime of people telling you you're not smart enough, of circumstances that have told you you're not worthy, uh, you're constantly forgotten, you're constantly, uh, you know, you may have, you, maybe you have been constantly torn down, maybe you constantly have been told that you're ugly, You've all, you know, you've had so many individuals in the, your past that have broken your heart, uh, whether it's situations that were beyond your control or situations you got yourself into. Those are things, uh, past failures that haunt you. Those are, can be roots that go in deep, that start to, when pressure is applied, or when certain circumstances uh, come back up seemingly again and again, that those words are spoken, those words come out of your mouth or you know, your attitude is expressed about that. And it just kicks in the cycle again. It kicks in that mentality again to where you really feel stuck. So you really wanna take that opportunity and that time to start reversing the process. You got to practice. Maybe for some of you, you have to practice saying that you're beautiful. 
maybe for some of you, you have to practice speaking over you that you're worthy, that you're worth fighting for, uh, that you're worth uh, going beyond living paycheck to paycheck. You're worth having a better life. Uh, you're worth being fought for. Uh, that your life, for you, your life, that you are determining that you're worth fighting for. And what are the things that you have to put into practice to make that happen? So in two, it is exercising, exercising our elect offspring authority. We are seated in high places in Christ Jesus. But how do we pull that back into the natural and the everyday life that we live? So that goes into what is your official capacity at, or the lack thereof? What is your official capacity of just where you're at right now? You know, what does that entail? Uh, how can that be worked on? How can that be improved? You know, your capacity is really defined on what you set your limits at. In all honesty, your capacity is your predetermination of how far you're going to go. Your capacity, because God has for you, like I said, God's already built within you everything that you need. So what is your official capacity? How far does God want you to go? Have you ever asked him? What are the things that he wants you to master and what is the official capacity of that installation? There's, those are things that as Dunamites, we should know. So again, you don't wanna just assume a title, but you wanna be able to do the work and take on the responsibility. All right, so deutomites conduct creation's invisible substance into its physical form. Into its physical form. Deutomites conduct. So let's look at conduct. She said that word for a very specific reason. Deutomites conduct. So let's look at what conduct means. It's the matter in which a person behaves, especially on a particular occasion or in a particular context. Speaking of conduct, we, we know a, a phrase that is very common for us is conduct becoming of an officer, meaning that person's conduct in their actions, their presence, their presentation, as well as their words indicates to any occasion or situation that they're an officer and not just in their uniform. You know, you have conduct unbecoming of an officer. That is, that officer is in uniform. That officer is presenting themselves as an officer, but what they are presenting and what they are saying does not match and does not fit the criteria and the standards of what an officer should be. That's conduct unbecoming it doesn't match conduct unbecoming of an officer, which is clearly laid out in scripture. So our dunamite conduct, how we behave, how we behave in word and deed. That conduct is creation's invisible substance that brings it into physical form. Your conduct is how that happens. Uh, conduct the action or manner of managing an activity or organization. That is your conduct. That is the conduct. So Dunamites uh, managed the activity of creation's invisible substance to bring it into physical form. That is our job and our duty as a Dunamite. So conduct to organize or carry out Deutomites carry out creations, invisible substance into physical form. So conduct is also to lead or guide someone to or around a particular 
place. So I know that was one that I didn't know about. So that I mean to that means to to guide around to conduct to conduct someone around something. So Judahmites are to conduct. They are to guide. They are to lead creation's invisible substance into the physical form. So how do we do that? We do that by through our words, through our faith, through our prayers, through our training, through uh, seats of power and authority that we are able to obtain. You know, it's again, it's not just in the prayer closet. You know, it's those taking those positions in our community, taking those positions in our schools, taking those positions in government, taking those uh, positions in department heads. You know, some of you, you're just like, hey, I want to just collect a paycheck. I want to do what I want to do. And advancement is something you never think about. You never think about being the one in charge because you don't want to take on that responsibility. You don't want to take on all that extra effort because you're just like, eh, that's work. That's work. That's a lot of work and I don't want to do that. <laughs> but that is how we bring creation's invisible substance. We bring that dunamite power into physical form. I mean, yes, our prayers are powerful. Yes, you know, praise and worship is wonderful and amazing. But unless that starts to impact outside the church walls, our dunamite power can be very limited. And God knows in today's, in today's world, in today's churches, in today's schools, we need dunamites. We need dunamites being able to be that agent on assignment for God. All right. So here we're going to look into, um, and we might uh, come back to this uh, a little bit later, but we're going to talk through the dunamite acronym. So it is decreeing. Excuse me. It is decreeing, which is legislation, legislation and commanding. So first it's being in that place that you can command. It's being in that position that you can command. But legislation, legislation involves a lot of moving pieces. It moves a lot of moving parties. Uh, it, it involves swaying and convincing individuals. Uh, it involves lobbying. I know uh, a lot of times lobbying, lobbying um, gets a, a bad rap, uh, but it involves lobbying, uh, positioning and commanding and fighting for putting into legislation, putting into legal practice, putting into law, God's credence and God's uh, declarations. Uh, the way of life that God is wanting, a godly way of life to be established here in our communities, decreeing. So obviously, you know, decreeing isn't just saying. So uh, unformed, uh, meaning to uh, awaiting shape or function, awaiting shape or function. Uh, that means doing all the prep work so that when it takes shape, it's solid. Uh, nuclear, um, and this is coming from the atomic organic cellulation. So atomic meaning at the atomic level, uh, and then organic meaning uh, that pure, undefiled, organic, original, cellulation. So it becoming cellulated, it being uh, what makes up just how our, our cells make up every part of our physicality. These, the dudamite mandate, uh, the dudamite power and miracle working of God being literally engrafted into us to such a degree where it literally is the building blocks 
of who we are. Anatomic, uh, meaning embodying material. So it literally is the embodying material like our skin, uh, like our muscles, like our tissues, like our ligaments. The embodying material is what the Deutamite miracle working power is supposed to be within us. Manifestation, appearing by God's power manifesting, bringing into existence God's miracle working power. Um, invisible, so it involves the unseeable, indescribable, indiscernible evidence. Our faith, our faith, uh, the evidence of things hoped for. So the dunamite mandate, the dunamite drills, the dunamite power, is bringing into existence what was initially unseen, which is why you can't go off of what is seen. Because your words, your mandate, your decrees are supposed to change that. And substances, which involves the manner, matter, sorry, the matter, uh, the elements, and the constitutions, the constitutes, the constituents of God's miracle working power. So, all right, guys, that is our time today. Like I said, we'll go into these in kind of more detail and start to break them down. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate you. I love you. I hope this has blessed you. Uh, continue to press into God and all he has for you. Amen. <laughs>